everybody. This is Beth Bond with uh, the Evangelical Environmental Network. I'm the director of women's ministries for EEN and run the EEN Moms Group. And I am so excited about our guest today because in some ways I'm introducing you to a new staff member that you may not realize that we have on board. Today um, on EEN Mom Talks, we're going to um, be talking to Dr. Jessica Mormon. She is the director sorry, the Senior Director of uh, Policy and Science for uh, Evangelical Environmental Network, and she is a mom of Liam and the wife of Chris, um, who is a uh, church plant up in the D.C. area, and um, we are so excited to have her today because she has all the things that are relative for us, right? Like the struggles of being moms, or how do you raise a good... Um, how do you raise, you know, your children with... Uh, answers on climate and um and also she has a doctorate in um paleoclimatology which i was sort of laughing about before we started not because it's not important but it's like you know some funny words that might be a little misleading so she's going to explain more to that and and what's really valuable about the conversation today is she's going to help us understand the sciencey side of stuff and make it make sense for us so jessica welcome Thanks, Beth. It's such a pleasure to uh, to be here on E and Mom's Talk with you. Thank you so much for the invitation, and just really excited to talk today. Great. So, tell us about um, Liam. I think four, right? He's four, right? He just turned five. Uh, oh. He okay. his birthday um, was the weekend. We were celebrating on the weekend when the world changed. <laughs> um, it was that weekend in mid March where, um, I think when, you know, everything just began to shut down. I'm here in Washington DC. So we may have shut down a little bit close, a little bit sooner than, um, some other parts of the country where, um, folks may be, but we had to make, um, a really big decision. I'll just, I'll step back and I'll tell you that, that Liam's favorite thing in life is his birthday. And I'm not kidding. The, uh, on the evening that we had, uh, after we had his fourth birthday party, he was already planning out his fifth. He oh. was ready to go. <laughs> and so we had this, this party planned out for his fifth birthday in mid-March. We had already gotten the cake for like 50 people. And we are trying to make the decision, is it wise to um, have this many people, even though we were going to meet outside at a playground, was it wise with um, the COVID crisis just coming to um, full awareness of its severity? Was it wise for us to bring all those people together? We wanted to celebrate Liam, but not put others at risk. And so we ended up calling it. <laughs> we, we canceled the party and we're luckily able to spin it for him that we were going to have this, this small, small party, small family party. He still got all his presents. He got to eat a lot of cake, which that's his favorite part of birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> It's everybody's favorite part of birthdays, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we have to eat the serving for 50 <laughs> or like a week and a half. We were done. We were done. <laughs> so Liam is five. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, and that's, that's, that's funny because um, um, there's a little bit of an age gap between you and me. But when I hear about birthday cake like that and uh, the generousness of that much birthday cake, I always think about that uh, skit about um, feeding the kids birthday cake for breakfast and mm -hmm. how if is not happy about that at all. So sounds like you're a good mom, like birthday cake every day, all day, right? It was that week. It was that <laughs> week. <laughs> so anyway, that's awesome. And and I think what else is um, so cool about your interaction with us here at EEN is um, you're also the wife of a pastor. Tell us what that's like. Yeah, that was um, uh, not a role that I went after myself, but a role that I found myself in. But I have to say it's, um, it's very challenging, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. It has been... Um, a real honor and privilege and pleasure in my life to um, partner with my husband in um, planting a church up here in Washington, D.C. Um, and so uh, it, and it's been a joy to be um, a co-pastor with him, with our congregation to 
uh, really uh, walk alongside people as they uh, wade deeper into their relationship with Christ, um, discover who uh, God has, has made them to be, the purposes he has planned for them, and just see lives transformed and enriched as um, we just grow deeper and closer uh, to God and to Jesus. And so it's, it's been a pleasure. Again, it's not to say it's not without its challenges. Um, it has been a challenge wearing many different hats. Um, but I, I'll, whenever, uh, just a little bit about my story when, um, when I was a, a teenager growing up. So I grew up in the church and, um, as many folks who, uh, maybe grew up in youth group, there was always, at least in my time, there was always this, uh, uh, question that often came up of who's being called into full-time ministry. And I was like, Ooh, me, me, me. Um, but I didn't know what that was going to look like. And I didn't feel like I was going to be a preacher or anything like that. Um, and so I, it wasn't clear, but lo and behold, I guess God, God knew what he was up to. And, um, that's kind of come to the fruition through my relationship with Chris, <laughs> um, by being a pastor's wife and a church co-founder with him. Wow. Well, and you know, that's, that's funny because I'm the opposite end. So I am a, I am not your typical PK, but I am a proud PK. Uh, my mother at the age of 60 got the call to go into ministry. So I actually drove her to Asbury um, that like, you know, the role reversal of taking your mom to college versus, you know, you know, your mother taking you to college kind of thing. And oh, I love it. <laughs> right. I know it was awesome. I and mean, I was like, oh, it's, you know, it's the Jesus. This is going to sound, and I, I don't want to be too flippant, but it's the Jesus dorm. Like, this will be so much better. No, no, no. It's a regular dorm with burnt popcorn smell in the microwave and, you know, girls running all over the place. And I was like, mother, are you sure you want to do this? So anyway, but um, yeah, so it's been really cool. And, and, I don't, I don't feel like God has called me into serving a congregation, but I do strongly feel like I've been called to do ministry, right? And so, um, you know, and I always joke and tell everyone, well, I have a, min a mini mi uh, seminary degree because every book that mother loved but never finished because she didn't have time to do it during the semester, I got. So I ended up reading them all. So um, anyway, you know. Yes, I always say that with degrees, the whole family should earn it. Everyone <laughs> should get the letter is after their name. <laughs> the whole family goes through it. And I also agree with you, like with um because I find that question of like who's gonna be in full time ministry, even that term full time ministry, I really feel like we're Jesus calls all of us to be in full time ministry right wherever he has us. And that's what I've also discovered through my journey is that um it's not a one size fit all kind of thing to be in ministry. We're each ministering um, in our own unique special context that God has placed us that um, whether that's in our workplaces, whether that's with our family, whether that's with our friend group, um, uh, with our, our hobbies, uh, that is, that's the mission field. There is ministry happening there. And when we only limit it to the church, um, we are actually losing um, a, a key uh, opportunity to see the kingdom come here on earth. And so, um, so yeah, everyone should raise their hand and fold that they're in full-time ministry because that's what each of us as followers of Christ are doing. Well, so I'm going to give you a big hashtag amen on that, sister. Um, and, and it is true. I mean, I think a lot of times people confuse attending church with confusing being a disciple and follower, follower of Christ. And that, um, you know, probably as the church, we've done a bad job of educating people about what their real call is. And it's not just to come to church, you know, at any given time that it's really like, follow me, it's full stop, right? It's follow me, full stop. Not follow me on Sundays or follow me on Wednesday night behind the buffet line thing, you know, it, follow me, which means all day, every day. And, um, you know, once you enter into the spirit with Jesus, it is so humbling and so tender and so special to know that Jesus personally wants to have a relationship with each and every one of us. And, you know, we all have our roles and it's not, and, and this is such a, a good segue into sort of, you know, the creation care conversation it's like not all of us are called to be leaders and not all of us called in pulpits, but we're all called to follow and we all have a role. 
And so for mamas who are staying at home, that's your role. That's an amazing, valuable job that you have, right? Um, and, it's a, and it's a tough one. It's certainly tougher than a lot of other people's jobs, um, especially now during the current situation um, where, you know, all of a sudden, not only do you have the kids at home, but your husband and you may be working on top of that and you're trying to juggle everything. And Oh, my gosh. So, um, yeah, that's really, really cool. So let's talk a little bit about what got you interested in doing you I mean what you didn't come through it through the, the terms creation care right but got you into sort of science and studying how the earth works and all that kind of stuff yeah absolutely yeah I didn't come to it knowing the term creation care but that was definitely what the spirit was speaking to me so I am a, a climate I'm a climate scientist because of my faith my faith led me to studying science and then specifically to um, dedicating my life to understanding uh, climate change and what we can do about that. And people are often a little bit surprised that my faith led me to, to science and, and climate science. Um, but it was, uh, first it was just kind of at that same time when I was discerning about um, whether I was going to go into full-time ministry, feeling the call to yes, that, um, but not in a traditional way, but not knowing what quite that looked like um, as a, a, a high school student, a senior in high school, looking at uh, starting my first year of undergrad in college, um, faced with the question that so many college students are faced with, what are, what are you going to major in? Um, I inexplicably kept on coming back to the answer of geology. And I couldn't explain it. I wasn't sure where that <laughs> desire was coming from. It's not one of your common ones. It's right. Like, <laughs> I want to study it. rocks. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it was just, just one of those things that I just couldn't escape. I, I tried to run from it, but I couldn't escape it. And I remember um, I was on a, a church mission trip um, with, uh, with my uh, youth group. We were building a house somewhere and uh, the youth leaders who were um, parents of one of my friends, I, they were asking, what are you going to do when you go to college? And I just shared this struggle. I was like, I feel like I'm called to ministry, but I also feel like God's calling me to study geology. I don't know how these things fit together. I don't even know if I'm allowed to study <laughs> geology. Um, kind of, uh, that had never been something overt in my church community, but just as a young Christian, just kind of felt it in the air that maybe there was something taboo and controversial about studying a science, um, especially earth sciences. Um, and so I was just sharing this struggle of, can I study this? How does this fit with, um, uh, joining God in his ministry on the earth? And they, they're so gracious and listened um, so patiently. And then uh, Kevin, the dad, after I finished, he just looked at me and he said, Jessica, don't you know that I'm a geologist? Oh. <laughs> yeah, my jaw just hit the, hit the floor. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. And I love God. <laughs> it's so good. It is so good. That was a conversation that changed my life because um, although I didn't need um, necessarily permission to head into that, just having him as a role model and an example of um, a Christian, let alone one of our church leaders being a scientist and a geologist, that exact thing that I felt God put a desire on my heart for, um, it all just came together to be like, yes, um, I can trust. He helped me understand that as we align ourselves with God, he puts those desires on our heart and we can trust them. And it's the proper response to be obedient. Even when we're not really sure how it all fits out, just be obedient in that step that God's calling you into. And so that's what I did. I decided to study geology in college. Awesome. <laughs> and so that, that, that's how I got my start, having that key role model um, within my church community show that actually um, those two things, being a, a, a church leader and a scientist and a geologist, they actually could fit together in, That's, in person. <laughs> I love, that is a great story. And a, a South, we're both Southerners. Let's just give a shout out that we're both Southerners. You know, we love good stories and what a great story that is. So, but geology and studying climate are really not in the same sort of bucket, 
science bucket. Right. Well, yeah, they, they are, they overlap. They overlap. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you how they overlap. So, um, yeah, whenever I started studying geology, I, uh, I, I, again, I didn't know how that would fit with that ministry angle, but, um, was just like, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to do this. And, and God didn't leave me waiting very long for it to come into focus, how those two things fit together. And so I was in, um, a freshman, my second year freshman lecture, and we studied past climates of how we use the oh. record to figure out what climate was like in the past before we had weather stations to tell us before we had thermometers um we can use the rock record to figure out how warm it was how cold it was how rainy how dry and a host of other things all captured in god's creation these little clues um, that are left in creation that then we can try and uh, figure out using the tools of science, um, giving us this window into the past. And so that just first captured my imagination and fascination with this incredible world that God has made. And then secondly, it, it clicked something. It really was the spirit in that moment, because in that moment, of um, learning about how we study past climates, I was also very aware that our present day climate is, is changing. It's changing at a rapid pace. And then also I, it brought to mind that it is the most vulnerable in society who are impacted the most by um, temperatures rising at such a rapid pace that we've never seen um, uh, in our, our human history. And knowing that, yeah, that the most vulnerable, that those who had contributed to it the least were going to be impacted and are impacted the most by our present day changing climate. And that just hit me in my spirit. It brought to mind Jesus's greatest commandment in Matthew chapter 22, where he says, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And in my spirit, I just knew that this is how I can join God in ministry by studying climate science, by helping to understand why and how the climate is changing and how we as people can um, help reverse that and begin to change that, mitigate it, slow it down to protect our neighbors. And, and that's where it set the trajectory, where God brought everything into focus and that set the trajectory for the next um, 15 years of my life till today. Um, and uh, set me on this path of uh, studying science, becoming a paleoclimatologist, and ultimately to EEN. That's awesome. And that, right, to, to be able, like, I, I, don't, I don't have that, we were, I mean, clearly brought up as Christians, but I don't have that story where God was there early on guiding me, right? And, I, and it's not that he wasn't there. He was absolutely there guiding me, but it's not sort of that clair, clarity in my mind. Um, I can like clearly say, you know, at this point, that's when I really felt the call and God was really starting to do the formational work. Although, you know, he's always with you. So I think that's really um, awesome. And I think it's a great lesson, right? For, for moms that, you know, just keep your heart open and, and he will, he will give it and you will have the comfort of the Holy Spirit to know when it's right. And if you don't know it's right, then ask, you know, a spiritual friend or maybe a mentor if you're in a mops group. Um, you know, hey, you know, I think, you know, I'm being called to do a community garden or whatever you're being called to do, right? Just be open to hearing the Lord and 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 then you got to follow. I always tease people now that the Holy Spirit is constantly knocking on my heart and um, he's actually sort of annoying. And if I don't take action on it, it just keeps on coming back up and up and up. All right, all right, I'm, I'm going, I'm going, right? So, um, yeah, that's, that's a really cool part of the relationship with, uh, Jesus. So, um, now let's talk a little bit about the science, because I think, um, in particular as evangelicals, you know, there's just so much stuff out there and some people are saying this and some people are saying that, and, you know, then you add the political layer on it and it just all gets confusing and sort of crazy. How, how do you start a conversation with someone about climate change? Yeah, I mean, it is really hard um, right now to know what information is trustworthy. Um, 
And so that's, that's why I'm really excited to be able to uh, have these conversations. And it really brings into clarity what God was up to <laughs> with, um, from the very beginning of kind of pulling my heart into these directions, because um, I, I love to be able to share um, kind of what uh, I've discovered on my journey with the Lord, bring in stories from you, Beth, and others at EEN and others in the creation care movement to help bring clarity um, to our community of, of what is real and, and what's just spin, <laughs> um, what's just noise, what's just distraction and misinformation, frankly. Um, and so I think one of the, the, the best ways to start is always starting with your own story, with something personal. Um, if this is if creation care, if um, creating a, a healthier, cleaner um, future and environment for our children to, to live and thrive in um, is, is something that's on your heart share with uh, how how that came to be, um, whether that was uh, through uh, uh, something that the Lord was tugging your heart on, if that was an article that you saw, um, a podcast that you listened to. Uh, <laughs> don't, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons why um, I can think of a lot of reasons why not to talk about it because it climate change, um, environmental stewardship, pollution, um, caring for the environment can feel like a controversial topic to bring up <laughs> and oh, yeah. we don't always want to be a Debbie Downer. We, we don't want to ruffle anyone's feathers. We don't want to be contentious. And I think that's kind of the perception of what um, talking about climate, environmental problems and pollution can drum up. But there's something that I, I um, some, some data that a good friend um, who's an expert climate communicator um, brought to, um, brought in, uh, introduced to me, and it's called the perception gap. And so this is where um, I, I, Folks have done surveys and research asking people, um, how, what do you think the general American population thinks about climate change? Is it happening? Is it not? Um, and how controversial is it essentially? What do you think that everyone else thinks? And then they'll get that data and uh, show that the majority of people think that for everyone else, um, it's a really controversial topic. Then when they ask them, um, do you think what do you think? Do you think climate change is happening? Is it real? Um, the vast majority says, yes, it is happening. It is real. It's caused by humans. And so there's this disconnect between what people self-report that they feel versus what they think other people think. And that's that perception gap that we perceive that others are going to find this more controversial than we do ourselves when in reality, um, for, you know, your regular majority of folks on the street, they're, they're ready to have this conversation, but everyone's just kept quiet because they think they're going to be received and um, uh, they're going to, that they're going to meet a negative response and just stir up trouble. And so getting over that perception gap is so critical um, for us to making progress, to making that healthier, cleaner future for our kids. And, and talking about it, um, just sharing those, those things in your everyday life of how um, uh, if, you, if this is something you're uh, implementing in your own life, some behaviors that are more sustainable, building a more resilient future, um, whether that's uh, composting or you are looking to buy a new car and you want to buy something with a higher fuel economy or even a hybrid or an EV, just talking about that and sharing your reason behind it. That's going to help um, signal to the rest of your friends that uh, this isn't a controversial topic for you. And that's going to bring down the pressure for them and um, begin if we each do that within our own, um, own uh, kind of social networks and communities and friend groups and families. Um, that helps bring down, lower the temperature of the conversation, if I can say that. And uh, make I like it, that. Yeah, <laughs> we need to lower the temperature of this conversation to make it easier. Um, and that's going to go a really long way. Um, but yeah, starting with those everyday things that you're doing. Um, 
as that basis for beginning a conversation, then you can tell them why, what's your reason behind it and um, uh, help them see where they can begin to implement things in their lives too that can help um, make this world more sustainable and a brighter place for our kids. Awesome. That is super, super, super advice. Um, and I think it, it does. And that's my family. I wouldn't say my family was necessarily denier. Well, maybe some of the family was deniers. So when I started this work, I just did stuff. Right. And then all of a sudden they started asking questions. And then when, so recycling was one of the big ones, like all of a sudden, like, Oh, I can do this in my, you know, community, like they didn't even sort of reach it out, which led to, and it's actually on the first season of EE and mom talk. Um, I, um, we had, I, I did an interview, but my sister and I did a couple of episodes together because all of a sudden I got a call one day from my sister. Um, and I'm, she's like, guess what I did today? I said, what? Well, I went to the County extension office and learned how to compost. I'm like, well, you know, I just throw my banana pills in the backyard. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and it was really cool. And they have become like sort of these really good little gardeners and really have enjoyed as a family together doing the gardening work. I'm, I am a lazy gardener. I like to go to a community garden or pay someone so I can pick all their work, you know? So, um, but you know, I know it's just, you know, me sort of just doing it right. That, that the curiosity is there. And I think that the other thing, and I think this is important language to have is, is you are providing a safe place, right? What we've learned through social media is, is that people trust people they know more than they trust anybody else. And so if you're the example, then you're also the, the place that they can feel comfortable. Now, if I have a gardening question, I go to my sister, you know, so, um, yeah, so I, I, I and I, I think, you know, one of the things that I think also, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, is that people are like, well, I can't talk about that. I don't know anything about it. Like they don't have the confidence. They think that they have to be able to show a bar graph and explain, you know, ice core rings and all that other kind of stuff to be able to talk about climate. And they certainly don't. Um, so would you mind like sharing some language with us that's not like about bar graphs and ice core ring studies and things like that? Uh, sure. Yeah. I've kind of, um, uh, what would be some like helpful, uh, tips and tricks to have in the, in, have in the bank for talking about climate change? Well, I guess this is what I'll say, at least is sort of in one's approach is you don't have to sit down and say, I'm going to, let's have that co climate change conversation. I think Beth, as you said, um, being that example, in your in your family and in your friend group um, speaks for itself and that opens those doors for further conversations and i always like to think about it as instead of a one-off conversation again like it's not that we're going to go have this talk now um, it's 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 a series of conversations along the way starting with how you are how um, you're folding this sustainable living into your life and um, bringing others along in that process as you share with them what it is, as you said in your own experience, Beth, they then ask why, and then that opens the door for you to share um, exactly why you are doing it and really let them see your heart and how um, uh, sustainable practices really fit within our values, values as, um, as Christians, uh, values as mothers, uh, values as just being really good citizens um, in society as well and uh, taking care of all God has um, entrusted to us and so I like to think of it as instead of a one-off thing um, as a continued conversation with the people who are in our lives so looking for those easy entry points um, to begin to have those conversations um, one thing that uh, I think is always great, again, kind of keeping in that framework that this is a continuous conversation as progression is if you do get a question that's about bar graphs and data and um, um, different data points that you don't know off the top of your head. Um, again, since it's a continued conversation, be like, I'm not sure about that, but I'm going to look it up for you. And going to some trusted uh, resources is always a great start. Um, the uh, EPA has an incredible 
uh, resource um, EPA uh, indicators website. So if someone wants to know, well, is climate change really happening? What are the different um, uh, things we've measured, um, whether that's temperature, rainfall, um, rising sea levels? So what are all the different indicators um, uh, that point towards a changing climate? Um, that's a great place to start. NASA even has a really great toolkit um, for explaining um, climate change. There's another website called Skeptical Science, um, again, run by my friend who told me about the perception gap. Um, his name is uh, uh, John Cook. He's a professor at George Mason's um, Center for Climate Change Communication. Really, he's been uh, put together a really incredible website that answers uh, the majority of those big picture questions that people have about climate. Um, that's a great place to start. And then the other, uh, the other place I'd suggest that people, um, if you want to get more information about climate change or and about uh, environmental pollution is to look up um, what's happening in your local area as well. Because as um, I think one of the I think one of the, the uh, most, the biggest barriers in having this conversation and getting the word out about um, that uh, global warming, that environmental pollution is a serious thing, is it feels like it's a over there thing, it's a not today thing, and that it's not happening to me personally or my community. And so really discovering what are the local impacts that are happening in my community um, can be really powerful to one, begin to connect with your friends and family on, on why we do care, why we should care, and, and two, begin to illuminate some things that you can do um, in your community uh, for that. And so a good resource for that information is uh, Climate Central. If you Google Climate Central, they have some really good localized um, information about different climate impacts uh, across the United States. Well, those are very helpful and I'll make sure that they're included on our notes on the YouTube page so people can just click on them and go directly to them. Of course, you know, if it's a faith conversation, your trusted resource is uh, creationcare.org, which of course is the Evangelical Environmental Network. Um, I have done a lot of blogs on teaching children to pray and Bible verses for children on creation care. Um, and things like that. And of course, we have all the, the big, bigger sort of adult conversations on it. Um, do you have a, this is, this may not be an ending question, but it feels like one. So, but I'm going to ask it, even if it's the middle of the conversation, do you have a favorite verse that you turn to for creation care? Oh gosh, I have, I have several. Um, so I will, um, I will try to, um, to keep them, um, I'll try and distill them down to just, just a few. But actually right now, the one that first comes to mind is Psalm 139, where God says that he knitted us together in our mother's wombs. And that shows the love and the care that he has for creation, for all that he has made, that he has for us um, as, as people, of people who've been made in his image. Um, the care that he has for us. And when I think of that verse, um, and this is where kind of my, my science background has come in, this is a, a verse that um, is a key example of how science, instead of being a barrier to my faith, has actually enhanced my faith. When I think about him knitting us together in, um, in our mother's womb, it's not just within those nine months. It's for the whole course of creation, because everything um, in, uh, in our Earth's history, in the universe's history, leads to that moment where we're created um, in, knitted together in our mother's womb. And I think about the love and the care that God knew each atom <laughs> that was going to be knit together to make me, to make my son Liam, to make um, every, every single child um, uh, here on Earth. I just feel the, the 
grandeur, the greatness, the bigness of God's love in that. And um, that's something that love is something that applies to all of creation as well. Um, whenever God created um, on each day of creation, he ends with saying it is good. We know that God um, values and loves this creation. And it's uh, then in um, uh, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, where he talks about handing over this precious creation that he's made, um, handing over the keys to us to be good um, good stewards of all he's made. Uh, in Genesis chapter 2, uh, 15, he talks about how we are to tend the garden and be good caretakers there. Um, and then um, jumping to the New Testament of thinking about uh, uh, Christ's mission to come to restore and reconcile um, all of creation, all of creation, us, but also all that God had made to restore and reconcile, looking at key passages um, in uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verse 20, um, and uh, Colossians chapter 2, 10. I may have gotten those 120 and 210s mixed up. Beth, if you can fix that for me, whenever you yeah. some <laughs> notes. Um, yeah. As uh, God talks about, as Jesus, as we are invited into Christ's mission of reconciling and restoring creation, um, we see it in the Old Testament, we see it in the New Testament, but this is very much um, what I think I see as a divine purpose and a divine assignment that God has given us to um, care for his creation and be good stewards of everything that he's made from our, our children as mothers to um, our neighbors and uh, extending out to the rest of the created world. And I'll just share a couple I have. Um, right now, this one keeps on coming up and this has been a favorite because I love that hymn, Here I Am, Lord. So Isaiah 6, 8, which says, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me, right? And that, that's good, that's good. Right, and it's that particular call like, send me, Lord, right? That everyone has the ability and the responsibility to say, here I am, send me, right? Whether, and that applies to everything in life, not just the creation care thing, although it's all interconnected and everything. Um, and that's actually something I posted on our EEN Moms uh, Instagram account this week was here I am, send me. Um, and the other one, and this is sort of funny. So um, I've taught to a lot of folks, especially down in South Georgia. Um, and, you know, everyone knows the story of Job, right? We all have the elevator pitch for the story of Job. But Job is full of these amazing poetic um, challenging chapters of God explaining like what he's done for us, which is really amazing. Um, but I was stunned and it happens three or four times in the later chapters, like 34, 36, 37, something like that. And the, it starts off basically, you know, Job goes into this period where he's sort of questioning God, like why, why, why? And the translation in the Bible is, Gird yourself like a man. So let me give you the little old lady Southern version of that. Put your big girl panties on, y'all. So, <laughs> yes. So, um, you know, uh, so, you know, it's like God has given us an amazing promise of relationship with him and has provided this beautiful home that we call and, you know, love and, and, and all that stuff. But at the same time, you know, like he never said it was going to be easy, right? He said, follow me. He didn't say, follow me only when it's easy or, you know, who's my neighbor, Lord? You know, who do you, you know, my, your neighbor's everybody or not, you know, it's not your neighbor who's everybody who agrees with you and lives on the same street. You know, it's everybody. And so um, I think we have to remind ourselves as Christians that, you know, like it's okay when it gets a little tough. It's a, it's a time to build our relationship with God. God, I will promise you, because I am the poster child, he's going to pull you through for whatever ad adversity there is. And um, you just have to trust in him and, and, and he will do it. It may not be the way you think it should be, right? I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges we have um, is you gave us free will, but I don't want this free will. You know, just fix it for me, God. So, um, and unfortunately, I really think that um, in, in, in some ways when, so this is being recorded right at the, sort of the reopening after COVID. 
and when when everything was shutting down and everything um and and people were like oh i can see the himalayas now like there was so much air pollution um you know i'm like maybe and i've been hearing some pastors call it the great pause like you know that you know this is one of those biblical moments where god is saying okay we i've given you enough free will um things have gotten really off kilter let's do a pause and hopefully we can realign you know back and you know because it's sort of running amok and you know some people would think i'm absolutely insane but that's my story and i'm sticking to no i was actually just thinking about that um uh before jumping on the podcast was that uh our society our world economy our lives um i think especially as women and mothers we can agree with this it's just running so fast so much to do so full so busy just running on all cylinders to the point that it feels like the cylinders are about to pop off <laughs> and right. this is not what God created for us. So this is not, I don't believe that that was his intent for us to run ragged and burn out and um, constantly feeling like we have to produce and be productive. And our, our society right now runs on productivity and um, they're just, I, I agree. I love that term, the pause, because I think we do need to pause. We do need to give rest. We need to give ourselves rest, um, again, in line with the Holy Sabbath, give ourselves that time of, um, of I, this is something I'm doing with a, a group of ladies in my church right now. We're reading a book on the Sabbath, using this time as things have been forced to slow down, uh, examining how we can better engage in actually taking Sabbath rest, recognizing that we've allowed things to get off kilter. I think as a society, we need to explore what does it look like to follow the wisdom and the commandment of taking Sabbath rest. There's a reason why God commands it for our good, um, not, not just for him, but for our good. And then also giving, giving the rest of creation a Sabbath rest. I love the, um, uh, the, the, con the, um, the year of Jubilee that um, yes. the Israelites celebrated every 50 years of uh, essentially doing a reset like we are today, um, except that was a, a, a something that they uh, followed intentionally and <laughs> of our kind of forced reset, um, but of letting land go fallow, of forgiving debts, of um, so many things with that year of Jubilee to uh, recognize uh, all of the, the gifts that, um, and productivity that God has, has given people's hard work. Um, but then take that time to rest and to celebrate, um, all of those things and keep things in a proper perspective. Um, this is a time of where there is so much pain right now, pain from, um, from loved ones who've been sick, um, who uh, maybe we may be grieving lost loved ones right now from the coronavirus. Um, this is the time of pain. We, it's a time of pain as we've seen the economic hardships that have happened um, as a result of this shutdown. Um, and then we also see laid bare um, pain from our, uh, as Americans, our, our history of our original sin of, um, of racism and, uh, uh, enslavement of a people of not seeing the Imago Dei, the image of God <laughs> in, in people. This is a time of pain. So I kind of just even using the term of year of Jubilee may feel like a disconnect with taking that pause. Um, but uh, I think we would be remiss if we didn't take this time to really search what the Lord has for us, the things that um, during this pause that we can carry forward um, in uh, in making a future that's more sustainable and resilient, that um, respects God's creation, um, people, um, as well as the created world um, moving forward. Right. Well, and you know, so we're talking about this and, um, and, I'm, and I may be wrong, but it, it, it's my perception. So, so I, you know, 
um, like we're past, we're two or three weeks past the reopening of, you know, the, the economy. And, you know, there were a lot of people who were impatient. And, and I want you to know that this is from a Christian heart servant humbleness that, you know, hearing people who are like, well, I want to be able to go back to the water park and I want to be able to go outside and eat at a restaurant. And why can't we just go back to what it was like before? And, but, you know, I didn't hear a lot of Christians <laughs> saying that, you know, I mean, you know, on the news, I'm not making judgment there. Maybe there were people, but I just felt like from the, the faith communities that I'm involved with and I'm, and it's numerous I and mean, it's just not my church, but you know, it's, it's broader than that. That I didn't really hear that urgency of, oh, let's get out there and start, you know, being crazy anymore. And I'm wondering if, and I always, I always love to look for the silver linings in, in any adversity. And I'm wondering if Christians are sort of like, you know, maybe, maybe this is the margins. Andy Stanley talks about this sometimes, mm -hmm. that we need to provide more margins in our lives. And, um, you know, hey, you know, we do miss seeing people physically, and it's been psychologically proven that um, people should have four physical hugs a day for emotional happiness. Um, and so I'm not saying that people don't really miss that, but as I've watched people adapt to having church online and how, like, you know what? Oh, it's really fun to be on Facebook together and be talking to each other during the service and, you know, having a pastor underline, you know, underscore things they've said in the sermon that, you know, that um, may, maybe, maybe not the entire world has been pausing and seeing this as a good thing, but I think that maybe some of us, those who are really trying to be humble servants are saying, you know what? This, this isn't so bad, right? I mean, you know, that maybe this gives me a little more time to practice my faith in ways I didn't think to, especially in a contemplative and meditative way, right? Which is so vitally important for our emotional health. I don't know. That's sort of what oh, I, I completely agree with you. It has given the opportunity to um, uh, one begin to give proper attention to and resource different aspects of our faith journey. As you said, the contemplative ways, um, uh, hearing from God uh, uh, in, in, a, in a quieter way, um, in a less, uh, maybe less corporate way in the sense that we're not all meeting together, but still corporate as we are uh, using technology to, to be together. There's definitely things within, for our own church community that are like, oh yeah, this is great. We're going to definitely carry this forward. And I agree with you just kind of with those silver linings, what um, really tapping into what the enemy means for evil, God can turn for good. And um, there's a lot of, um, uh, bad things that have that I really feel like the enemy is trying to to stoke in this time. Um, how can we, as the people of God, um, partner with Him to turn it for um, our good and His glory, and uh, bringing heaven just that extra piece down <laughs> to earth, and having earth being more aligned with God's will. Um, so those are things that I'm searching for for uh, myself and for our community, and even for Ian of um, where are those places that um, uh, we can further advance the kingdom because of this upheaval? All right. That's really good. So um, I really thought we were going to talk more about science, but I'm sort of like excited that we're talking more about Jesus. I think that's awesome. So tell me, tell me some takeaways y'all have from church during this time. What do you Yeah. Um, I think, well, one thing we found that, um, Again, where where are our values that the values that kind of drive our church community are worship, family, and justice. And as a new church plant, um, we are about four years old now, and um, kind of we have the worship side of things, our services, um, bringing people into the presence of God through music, through worship, um, through corporate prayer, um, has been. Uh, very much a key part of our of our church the family side of things of having really robust what we call house churches which are kind of like small groups that are just a little bit bigger um all across the city bringing people together focusing on building that family side of things and then doing justice um uh activities together um that's kind of been the heartbeat of our church um and then so it really took some um, 
especially whenever that corporate worship side <laughs> was, was taken out and having to adjust to um, church online, not feeling that time of togetherness, of doing our house churches um, online had been, uh, that, that had been a difficult thing. And uh, looking at where we can press in even further on the justice side, which hadn't been as resourced, um, just as we were spinning up kind of the foundations of growing as a body, growing deeper in the presence of God, growing deeper in the presence of each other, the justice side of then uh, the outflow of that, how can we serve our community um, was something that we were just stepping into. And it's been a really incredible time for us to, um, on the, the family side, begin to discover how we can uh, better bring um, we've seen leaders emerge um, during this time who uh, maybe have been a little bit more quiet, who um, uh, maybe they're more introverts, so I don't want to make it an introvert extrovert thing, but we have seen leaders emerge during this COVID season um, that is kind of going business as usual. They may not have stepped up to the plate just because it wasn't as conducive for them. So this has been really eye-opening for us as, as um, church leaders of um, how can we create um, places where it's not just the extroverts <laughs> that thrive, but um, for those who uh, maybe are more likely to sit back but have really great ideas and great contributions. How can we get the most out of every member of um, our community and help raise them up? as leaders. I think everyone in a church community is called to be a leader um, in their unique way. And so this has been really eye-opening of how to um, uh, raise more people up in leadership in ways that are conducive and um, really fit with them. Um, and then on the justice side of things, it's just been um, incredible to have this time to really resource as looking at, a, as a community, um, those uh, areas that um, we want to gather people around to see God's um, kingdom justice and kingdom healing come on the earth. And so um, uh, it's been a time for us to really take a pause and um, set in place some key structures that we can begin to begin to make some real progress of um, deciding what are those specific areas that God is calling us into of racial reconciliation, of creation care, um, of um, uh, refugees and human trafficking. And so it's been a time for us as everything, the, the whole <laughs> spring and summer schedule for the church was just thrown up in the air of kind of retooling and realizing that we can use this time to begin to really organize and resource um, more on that justice side, especially as everyone's heart is really just towards what can we do? We want to help. <laughs> we want to help people. We want to help people who are, are, are hurting so much. We want to help members in our community who are hurting so much. Um, and so uh, that's been something that we've been really pressing into as, as a church. And just on the creation care side of things, um, there are so many connections between um, uh, COVID and our poor stewardship of the earth, whether it's the emergence of infectious diseases coming from um, the very, um, I, I won't say complex, it is complex, but it's, it's, it takes a couple steps to connect all the dots, but um, the connection between infectious diseases and deforestation um, of how we, um, how we do farming and markets of um, bringing animals um, together so closely and under stress, which becomes those breeding grounds um, for infectious disease. So there's very much a creation care connection to um, the coronavirus, as well as then once um, the coronavirus has emerged, that connection between um, living in a highly polluted area, being exposed to pollution, dirty air, um, especially, uh, that has made, a, uh, made those in those areas, um, particularly those in low-income communities, those in um, uh, people, some communities of color, uh, makes that, ex that long-term pollution exposure makes um, once, if you do get the coronavirus, that um, you're going to be more likely to experience more severe effects from it, uh, more likely to be hospitalized. And so um, 
those are kind of, we're taking this opportunity to look at those connections and see how we as a church community, something we're also explain, exploring at EN of how we can um, uh, further bring that message that creation care really has um, significant impacts on the things, the people, um, the values that we have as Christians. And we can't ignore, um, if we ignore creation care in that, um, then we're missing a key piece of the puzzle to uh, lifting people up, making sure that they have um, a healthy present and a healthy future. So valuable, such valuable, thoughtful insight. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And of course, I keep on thinking about um, what Mitch says is that we, we lose 200,000 people every single year from air pollution issues. Like people, 200,000 people die. Um, and I, I do not want to minimize a single human life in regards to who we've lost for, for COVID, but we're, you know, like I said, we're dating. I, we always, I always am bad about dating a podcast, but you know, we're, we're sitting at about 110,000 deaths right now. And that's for, it's a very short period of time, but it's for one period of time versus every single year, 200,000 lives. And, you know, we're crying out and paying for these 110,000 lives as well. We should, but do we ever cry out for those 200,000 lives? And the reality of it is it's because nobody, know, you know what I'm saying? The, not the right people know. If the media knew to sort of expose this, I think it would be a very different conversation. So, um, well, I have enjoyed our time. As I knew when we, I would, um, enjoyed our time so much together. And um, this has just been a real blessing and a very holy space. So thank you for being here with us and sharing. Um, you have any parting things you want to share with our ladies, our mamas? Oh, goodness. Um, just circling back to that, that um, our conversation on rest and Sabbath. <laughs> take it. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Take it. Take it. It is a holy thing, especially as we've all been running a bit ragged. Um, do take that and just um, also just have grace for yourself. Um, there. Yeah, there's a lot going on, but uh, also really just encourage people to um, encourage our mamas to, as we are, are taking this time to rest, taking this time to pause. And um, as Beth, as you were saying of uh, raising our hands and saying, yes, Lord, <laughs> send me, I'll do it. Um, really taking in those moments, uh, time to ask the Lord um, to seek his voice and Lord, how can I specifically where I'm positioned, the community I'm in, the, the children and the family that I steward, how can I partner with you to be a good steward? What does that look like for me? And there are so many incredible resources, as Beth said, on um, Ian's website at creationcare.org, uh, giving you a grid for some of the things that you can begin to, um, as the Lord's calling you into this, and as you're discerning and listening, finding what um, things fit with your life, um, there's so many different things you can do that will lead to, um, I truly believe, because this is how it's been in my own life, a deeper relationship with God, um, a deeper connection with your family as you're doing things together, and has incredible kingdom impact for our world today and going into the future. So definitely um, head to the website to check out more about how you can get involved and begin to fold those things into your own life. Awesome. Um, really quickly, what are you, what, what book are y'all studying with the ladies? Oh, um, it's called Sabbath. Um, very simple, but I can get you the, the full details of the tagline and I'm blanking on the author, but it's called Sabbath. Right. We'll include those in the notes of, um, also. And, and, and ladies, I, I will invite you, um, you know, this will be, this will be housed on YouTube. Um, of course we'll have it on their EE and Mom's Facebook page have any comments or questions um, please put them in the comment section and Jessica and I will do our very best to get you an answer or, or pray for you so I always like to end our time together with prayer um, do you want to pray or do you want me to pray I, I can I would be very happy to pray super great great well father God thank you so much for this time together this time of fellowship um, Again, just the creativity that you have as creator God, that you have um, infused in us as being image bearers of you, that we, 
that Beth and I can have this conversation um, hundreds of miles apart in two different cities that then we can broadcast to um, these wonderful women and incredible mothers, Lord. Um, I just pray that uh, uh, the words that um, you have put on mine and Beth's hearts resonate with um, uh, with our mamas who are listening, that you will, uh, through this, that they will have um, uh, a, a window into your heart and really hear from you the stirrings of the spirit um, that that come whenever uh, the the people of Christ come together. So I just pray that this, um, just even from listening, um, if they've had a, a time to uh, uh, get away from the kiddos and the family and just have a moment to themselves. I just pray that this has been um, uh, life-giving, uh, inspiring, given a greater window into your love for us and how we can partner with you in um, transforming this world into a better picture of heaven, um, that picture of the garden that you gave us from the very beginning. Um, so, Lord, thank you. Please illuminate those places where we can say, yes, Lord, send me to do that. And, um, yeah, I just pray that it be a joy uh, and encouragement uh, to the women who are listening. And I just want to say um, thank you. Thank you for, for each listener. Um, and I, I pray that they feel your great love for them in this moment. In your name I pray. Well, Jessica, I cannot thank you enough. This has just been wonderful. I was looking so much forward to it and really appreciate your time because your time is valuable, mommy. Oh, Beth, thank you so much. This has been such an honor. Definitely worth taking this time out of the day to do it. Um, and I, I just feel like we could talk for so much longer. <laughs> so, um, so it's just been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Right. I, hashtag guilty. We probably could talk longer. So thanks so much. Thank you.